My name is Charles Harrell. I'm with the Veterans History Project. I'm here interviewing Mr. Alan C. McLean. For the record, Mr. McLean, would you pl please state your full name? Alan Cole McLean. Can you spell your middle name? C-O-L-E. And what is your current address? 6105 Ridge Tree Road, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Can you tell me the date of your birth? 1 of March, 1923. And where were you born? Hope Mill, North Carolina. Hope Mill? M-I-L-L-S, Hope Mills. And that was March 1st? March 1st, 1923. Here today, including Mr. McLean, is myself, Charles Harrell, and Billy Krotendorfer. My great grandson. What war did you serve in, Mr. McLean? World War II. And what branch of service were you in? I was with the 101st Airborne Division, 502 Regiment, Company G. Were there any other regiments you belonged to? Uh, not during that war. How about before the war? Uh, I was with the... Uh, before that war, I was a member of the 120th Infantry, 30th Division. Company L. What rank were you when you first joined the service? Private. And what were... The, what was your rank at the end of World War II? Uh, I was a sergeant. And when you finally retired? I was command sergeant major. And what date did you enlist? I enlisted uh, the 27th of October 1939 in the Army National Guard, North Carolina. <clears throat> and when were you transferred, can you recall? We were uh, called to active duty 16th of uh, September 1940, as I remember. And when you were transferred to the 101st, or uh, the 502nd, I mean? I, was, I, joined, uh, I, I joined the paratroopers and took my training in Fort Benning in 1942 qualified as a parachute jumper. Let's uh, go back a little bit. Uh, and one, one more question for the record. When did you retire from the military? Uh, 28th of February, 1973. And you also mentioned you were in the uh, in Korea also. Could you tell me the company and regiment? Yes, I was with uh, the 321st. Wait a minute, I got one. I got one before that. I was with the uh, 17th Infantry Regiment of the 7th Division. Right. And uh, it was headquarters company. And that was in Korea. It was in Korea. That, that was the first time. And the second time. Second time I was with. Uh, 321st Army Security Agency Battalion. And that was uh, in the 60s? 61 or 62, I believe it was. Let's go back during um, where and when you were born. Mm -hmm. um, you're a native North Carolinian. Mm hmm. Can you tell me about your father and mother? Yeah. Uh, as all of us were back in that day, it was very poor time. And my father and mother raised a big house full of children, nine boys and six girls. What were their names? Oh, Lord. What was the name of your parents? That's what uh, John McLean and Ada McLean. Okay. And where did you fit in the children? Oh, we had three older boys, three middle, and three... Little, I was one of the middle ones. 
So I was the youngest one of the, thir the middle three. And these were all from the same wife and yep. husband? Mm -hmm. What did your father do for a living? He was a farmer. What did he farm? We, our money crop was tobacco and cotton, but we had uh, corn, uh, hay, and, and things of that nature. When you think back to your earliest moments of memory, can you tell me when and what that memory was of growing up? You mean my very first? The, as far back as you can go. It's funny, but the, the most thing I remembered, it's sort of odd, but uh, I believe it was in 1927, as I remember, we had an awful big snowstorm. And I can remember an old, our old car was stuck and they had to take the horses and pull that up. And I remember that ice had had cut the horse's feet and it left blood on that ice. And that's, I don't know why, but I remembered it. And that was 1927, I mean, I was about four or five years old, you know. Were you with your parents at the time? Yes, uh-huh. As you were growing up, by the time you really started knowing what was going on around you, it was the Great Depression, am I right? Yes, all of it was during my time. Can you uh, remember an incident where the Great Depression truly affected your family? Oh, yes. <clears throat> there was six of us going to a school, and we had to catch a bus to school back in those days. And the school bus was a... The driver was the owner of the school bus then. It wasn't any county schools or anything, county buses. And uh, we used to, uh, six of us go at one time, and we had to walk almost a half a mile out to the main road to catch this bus. And uh, it was uh, it was awful poor people back in those days, all of us, everyone. Mill companies, employees, whatever one was. It was a, a bad time, you know. And... Uh, so we went to school, and I can remember that even the principal of the high school, writing on the board, had big patches on the seat of his britches, you know. And I, I remember little things like that. It's unimportant, but, you know, it was uh, something that you wouldn't see these days. Is there anybody when you were young, still in elementary to middle school, before you made it up to high school, that uh, that really made an impression upon you? No, no not as I know of. I know my uh, my brother John. He uh, he sort of made an impression on me. He, he would type it with uh, any job he did. It would have to be perfect. Like uh, if he was uh, planting corn or cotton or whatever, it had to be the very straightest rows that. Uh, or he would be unhappy. He always made a remark if he had to, if he had to uh, dig a ditch, he said he'd make it the straightest and, and the best ditch in the county. You know. Is he older than you? Yes, he was one one brother between he and I. In fact, he passed away two years ago or three years ago. And uh, I guess that sort of stayed with me is do the best you can when you're doing something. You know. Uh, what was the name of your parents? John and Ada, A-D-A, McLean. And uh, did you have grandparents nearby also? Yes, I had uh, grandparents. Uh, don't remember much about them because I was about two or three year old. They had what they called a homecoming. And uh, we used to go down there and uh, have a big meal, cookout, things like that, you know. But uh, I barely remember them. I know they had a long beard. and, and uh, Were they gone by, by the time you started realizing what the world was about? Yes, uh -huh. they, were, they died. Not till I wasn't in half grown. And uh, as a kid, uh, one of nine, how was it growing up for in such a large family for you? I think we took care of each other more than anything else. And we, uh, we grew money crops, then we grew vegetable crops, and we grew our own, we had our own milk, our own butter, and uh, 
and uh, I own corn, and, uh, and there's a lot of trading going on, uh, hams for coffee and things, and sugar and stuff, you know. But it was, um, it was a good time. We sort of took care of each other, and uh, I know my mama has said many times that it was 10 years at a time we didn't have a doctor come on our place, you know. And uh, back in those days, you get a doctor, you just, you'd have to go a call and he would come out to your house, you know. Do you remember any chores that you were assigned and, and work you had to do on the farm? I was a... <clears throat> I was sick most of my life, from the time I was 16 to down to about six year old. I had asthma, and uh, I couldn't uh, I couldn't go out and get wet all over at one time like the other kids, and I couldn't run long. And uh, and uh, it uh, it's amazing because uh, I finally got over it when I went into the service. I never had a bad cold. I never had a sick of asthma since. And I went in when I was just 16. I mean, I was 16, almost 17, and uh, I never, I never did uh, have an attack again. And uh, when I was young, I couldn't even bathe all over. I had to wash one end and cover it up, and then wash the other end. And and it was a, uh, I just didn't think I'd ever make it sometime, but I did, you know, and. Uh, and when I went into service, I slept in water and I walked and got wet and it didn't bother me. Nothing. I don't know why. It, it was some environment in the uh, homestead there or what it was, but I never, I'm almost 82 and it never has bothered me since. When you were a kid, what was probably the most funny thing that happened in your family when, when you were a child before you went into uh, service? Well, I, I don't I don't remember much about the uh, uh, funniest thing. We, we went to school and then, uh, of course, and we, we played baseball. And, and uh, the best thing was when we'd get to pull off our shoes every, every Sunday, every summer, we'd have to go out and fleece them all the grass and things. We had to build a big old grove. We had to pick all of that up and, uh, and put it in the old buckets and then get it out of the way. But then we could pull our shoes off. And we run around the farm without shoes, and uh, it uh, the we played ball with each other in the front yard, running from oak tree to oak tree. And, and uh, I remember getting in the old and we had old tires. You get in a kid inside, and you want to push down the hill and uh, let him roll. A naturalist boy to try to run the girls into a tree or something. So it's a, it's a, it wasn't any. Uh, we worked most of the time. When we come home from school, we'd jump off the bus and run into the house and get a, a some sort of a snack, and then we'd what we call pull off our school clothes. We put on our work clothes and we'd go into the fields until it got almost dark. Then we came in. So it wasn't much. Uh, it, it, it's no. We used to be an old old uh, clay hole not far from us, and when it would rain a lot and get about half full, we used to go up and jump in that thing. That was a lot of fun, I thought. And uh, we went fishing a lot around the, the little stream. We'd go out and catch little catfish and things like that, you know, little pikes and catfish. And, and it's a wonder snakes hadn't bit some of us, but we never did, though. We well, had a good time, come to think of it, you know. When you were growing up, was there any catastrophes that happened in your family? Mm, no, uh, I don't believe there was any at all in my family. And, uh, nothing that happened to any of the children or the mother, daddy, or brothers, sisters, or anybody. It's all, all okay. I know when my sister was born, what they call a blue baby. Back in those days, she was a little tiny thing, about three pounds, but now she probably weighs as much as I do, almost. She's real healthy, and that was something that was odd that I thought of at that time. So. Did you um, have any recollections about what F. Franklin Roosevelt was doing about trying to fix the Great Depression, some of his programs? Oh, yes. I, I remember uh, uh, WPA, the CC camps, and those things. I remember my brother was a member of the CC camp. What was his name? Uh, William Heck. 
McLean. And uh, in that way, uh, I think he got a little money and uh, and $25 or something was sent to my mama. And, uh, so, and then uh, they had road gangs building, uh, building roads uh, uh, where sandy ruts were. They built clay roads through by our home. And uh, that was uh, part of the uh, project uh, and build forest fire lanes you know, to keep give the people work to do, the, and I guess that's the way to survive. And I don't know how. Did you participate? No, it was a. I think the prisoners done most of that. Some of the prisoners uh, they had to be what they call road gangs back in those days, and they had they worked them on the road, and uh, of course they give them something to eat and somewhere to sleep, and that's that that all it was to have anymore in those days. Did your brother William go out of the state to work in the city? Yes, he, he went, uh, well, it wasn't out of the state, he went from uh, down a little town of Hope Mill where we live up to uh, Asheville. And there was a big, a big they built a CC camp, they built big fire lanes across mountains where, where, where it wouldn't catch fire and burn the whole place, and he was part of the CC camp. And that was uh, one of his projects there. Did you visit him while he was in the CCC camp? No, he visited us because I was too young, I guess. And uh, I did, jumping forward a little bit, I did see uh, President Roosevelt. Uh, I was in then in the service. Jets got into service. And I believe it was about 1940 or something like that. And he'd come by and... Uh, Convertible, not a convertible, big old touring with no top on it, and he waved to all of us, you know. It's, and I thought that was something great, you know. When you were uh, just before you went into service, did you belong to or or associate with any particular political party? Were no. you a Democrat or Republican? Or? No, I never, I never voted till after I was in the service. My dad was a Democrat, though. He, Back in those days, you had to be a Democrat. You know, Southern farmers all were Democrats, you know. But I never got into political thing until after the war, you might say. How did you uh, feel about segregation and and the black peoples of the South, your family and you? How did you react to them? Well. Uh, I don't believe it has ever been explained exactly uh, by anyone. Just what was the uh, what was the North and South? It was, uh, wasn't necessarily the racial problem. It was uh, a business type deal, as I understand, on um, imports and exports. I don't know now. I've, been, I've read some articles on it, but uh, but we uh, the people were really nice. The black people we call them black people then I guess I can say it now and they uh, they were really good we we would uh, we would hire them to come and work and, uh, and one particular in fact there was a, a black lady that brought me into the world we did, we had I don't, what do you call a lady that comes and uh, assist in birth I forgot what you call them midwife midwife yeah on about seven or eight was children and we didn't even have a doctor afterwards the doctor would come down later and say, well, she did as good as we could do, and you were fine, and that was it, you know. Did, did you see evidence in where you grew up of, of the separation of blacks and whites legally? And Well, the only thing, yes. Uh, even since uh, uh, it hasn't been that many years, there was a little hut going from here to North Carolina on the right side of the road, and it sort of angered me a little bit. Because I stopped in and it had a, a shelf on one side that said white, and over here it said black, you know. And it, so I just turned around and walked off. I said, I know parts of this, you know. And that was a, between here and Fayetteville, North Carolina, a little hut on the right side serving sandwich and drinks and stuff. You know? But uh, I never, I never studied being racist or anything like that. It's, uh, they uh, always treated pe people good and always treated me good. So, uh, and I know uh, when we first went in, we did have a black company uh, in Port Jackson, South Carolina. And uh, there used to be some problems when they go downtown on the, 
With the 120th Infantry? Yeah, uh -huh. used to be some problems there, see. The, but uh, we were, we had a lot of boys, all the boys uh, ran in with me were poor, un, just like me, uneducated, poor people who uh, day by day living, you know, there was no progress or nothing and you, you couldn't go, you couldn't even finish high school because you had to come home and go to work on a farm. That's all the way you can make a living, you know. How far did you get in high school or how long? I finished finally, but I finished after I went into the service. Before you were, before you went into the service, how far had you gone? I went up to 10th grade in the, the and I was in the National Guard, so they, so they, they called me to active duty, so I, I finished high school in Tombstone, Arizona. <laughs> then I finished college uh, after the war uh, in Florida. And uh, the only reason I did that is so the younger people say, well, my grandpa went to college, maybe I should go. I, I guess I was the only one in my family that did. So I, I, was, I didn't necessarily go to be so much smart, but it was, uh, I just wanted to leave a little legend there. Maybe that would help. What what part of the state is Hope Mills in? Uh, North Carolina. What part of the North Carolina? It, south of uh, south of Fort Bragg, about tw about ten miles. Can um, you uh, can you tell me your best friend growing up? Here, yeah, Norley W. Williams. We went in the service together. Went in the National Guard together. We went in the service together. And uh, but when I went to the Airborne, he stayed with the hundred twentieth. And, uh, I want to go back to um, your friend. What did you do with him that really made you and him connect? We went to see our girlfriends together, you know. And well, he lived above uh, up in a home right above me, and uh, on another farm. And uh, there, you just uh, find somebody your age you buddy around with. We went to see our girlfriends together, and uh, we went in the National Guard together, and. Uh, we would come home. We would come home on, on leave from Port Jackson to see our girlfriends. We didn't have more than fifteen cents between the two of us, you know. But uh, it's all right, and uh, we would laugh about it because we'd bum a ride home or bum, bum it right, you know. We had a good time. So, what made you decide that day that you and your buddy William decided to go join the National Guard? Well, <clears throat> a a dollar, a dollar a week. When you went down there, and you in a dollar a week was a lot of money. People don't know about that. You get a dollar for drilling, you know, but for going down for a two-hour drill. We thought that was great money, so we went down and we get uh, four dollars a month out of it, and uh, that was great for us. And uh, then uh, I don't know. He, we decided to go in and and, and try it, and we did. We liked it, and uh, and. Uh, we passed the physical and everything went in, so we we decided uh, that's for us, and so and then we like I say we went to active duty and together, and we stayed together there for two years almost. Tell me about the training that you had to do in the National Guard, the hundred twentieth regiment. Before we went on active duty, or uh, before, yeah, yeah, we used to. Uh, there was a little town this. Uh, this company L was in, and it was only about 30 or 40 of us. And uh, we used to take uh, what they call extended order drill, and we'd run through people's yard and everything, and fall in the right firing position, and and, uh, and this type of thing. It was, uh, and they talked to you, and uh, and then we go two weeks. We go two weeks down in Mississippi on the training and. Uh, and we thought it was great to get on a train and go to Mississippi, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and take two weeks training. And uh, we enjoyed it, and uh, it was something to do and keep you out of trouble, and you make a little money too, you know. And uh, we didn't think about much of being patriotic or anything. We just uh, wanted a job, I guess. There wasn't any jobs. We considered ourselves lucky to get back. During the week, you went back home and worked on the farm. Oh yeah, well, yeah, well, uh, you just uh, we'd have to go out about six miles once a week to uh, to drill two hours and then come back home. You, you you didn't stay there or anything until you were mobilized. When you mobilized, then we the whole unit moved out and went into uh, 
permanent duty down in South Carolina. Tell me, tell me about your first job that you had off the farm. I never had one. So you went directly, and the only mm -hmm. job you had off the farm mm -hmm. would be the be the, uh, well, the see, National I was Guard. In school, and I was in school, and I was a member of the National Guard, and they went on active duty, so I didn't have any any job. I, I never had a I never had a civilian job until I got out of service. Really, can you tell me what was going through your mind? when the war in Europe started in 1939? Well, in 19, uh, let's see, uh, in 1939, no, I didn't, I didn't think much about it, but I'm, I was young and, and, and I, they were drafting boys in that were much older than I was. I know when the neighbors came in and I was, uh, I was training those boys as a, I was a 18 year old bad corporal back in those days and uh, my neighbors all were drafted in there and they didn't understand that so uh, but uh, as far as uh, looking to the future and I guess I wasn't uh, even interested in wasn't interested but uh, couldn't see that far or something I guess about what time did you realize we would get involved in World War II I don't. I don't think I really got. Uh, I, I really got into real bad until Pearl Harbor. Do you remember where you were on the day yeah. you heard of Pearl Harbor? Exactly. Where I was a, I was walking guard along a railroad track in Fort Jackson when they come down and says, "Be on the alert, the Japanese is bomb Pearl Harbor." I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, you know, and. Uh, so they told us to be on alert then, and that was uh, the same day. And Do you remember who told you? Some sergeant was in charge of the guard duty. But nobody in know now. No. How about your friend, your buddy? Yeah, he, Where was, he, he? was with us then, and he was he was on guard somewhere else, I suppose, or doing a, another job, I don't know. But, but they told us, and uh, that's how come me to, uh, I can... Realized it like it was yesterday. I was walking along railroad tracks with box cars lined up over here, on so and and, and somebody run down to the sergeant of the guard come down and told us be extra careful, you know. And uh, then I realized we were living in a war. What type of extensive training were you doing when you were with the National Guard? After 1941, December, you know, after Pearl, did they do any extra training with you? Well, I, <clears throat> yeah, we went through, a, I was a, in a training cadre. I trained people. That was my sole job as long as I was, uh, as long as I was at Port Jackson and, and before uh, I went to the Airborne, I was a training cadre NCO. And we trained people how to wear a uniform and uh, uh, how to become a soldier. How to wear a uniform, the how to speak, and many many of them were in bad shape. I mean, physically, the boys in the country come in because that's a good living for them. You know, back there, people people these days can't realize how bad it was, um, economical wise, and it was a uh, it's really uh, I I couldn't now I can't. I could see it now, but then I, I had no idea what war was all about. You know. Do you remember any of the people you taught? Anyone that sticks in your mind? Or maybe not name, but just was there any tough students? Any, any what? Any tough students who just didn't get it or? <clears throat> no, there was a. I know there was a big Indian guy. It, uh, I was trying to march him in a forty-eight man platoon. And he kept bumping up and down, bumping up and down, and bumping up and down. And I reached over and got him with a shoulder and dragged him out there and said, What's wrong with you, son? Can't, what's wrong with you? Don't you? Can't you stay in step or nothing? He said, It's my foot. I said, What's wrong with your foot? He put his shoe off. He didn't even have a, he, it was what we call a club foot. It was just a, a knot for a foot. I said, How in the world do you get in the service? He said, well, they told me to drop my pants around my feet. He said, the examining man says, you're good. And uh, so uh, 
I said, you want out of service? He said, yes, sir. I says, come with me. In about three weeks, he was civilian again. It's funny how it happened, but I remember that. That particular thing, you know. You pulled that, that big Indian guy out, oh, and you yeah. said that, and you, I just noticed you said son. Yeah. Now, you're only 18. Yeah. How did it feel to be telling somebody who might have been older than you, son? Yeah. Well, sometimes you can, you have to work psychology on a lot of people. If you, if you call them, you get out of here, you know, or something like that. If you just talk to him like uh, he's your He's equal to you or something. You can communicate better. You don't have to treat him like a dog, you know. You can call him son or, hey, fella, or soldier, get over here. And There's all kind of ways to handle it without jerking him out, you know. I just took him by the arm and pulled him out and asked him what was his problem, you know. And he told me, son, what's the matter with you? Can't you stay in step? And, uh, and uh, he, uh, he showed me. And then uh, I felt bad then, you know. Had you been trained on how to approach folks by anybody, or was this a natural thing? It, it's, a, it's a natural thing, and you have a, you have platoon officers, and then you have platoon sergeants, then you have squad leaders in each one of those, you know, and and uh, you get together and uh, find out what you're doing wrong and what you should do right, and uh, of course, you have some people that, that thought that uh, you're supposed to be bad and rough and tough, but I never did buy that concept of it at all. I thought uh, there's some people you have to be sturdy with more than you do others, but most people uh, understand and tell them that I have a job to do. I've been told to do this job, and you have a job to do, and you've got to do what I tell you to do. And I mean, it's, most of the time it worked out. You find a dud once in a while that uh, object to anything so but it's uh, most of them were decent people I never had no bad ones what rank did you achieve while you were in National Guard I was a corporal and at what do you remember the date that you switched to uh, airborne training it was in I don't know the date but it was 42 and did you know what you were getting into yeah, I, I had to give up my rank of corporal and go into airborne as a private. That's the way it was then. Uh, you had have to you... leave your rank with your company. That's a, a thing they had back in the old days. When you leave a leave an organization, if you were a sergeant or corporal, you'd leave your rank within that company. So why did you want to leave? Double money, twice as much money in airborne I was making there. How did you find out about what the airborne was going they to do. They come out and ask for them. They ask all the information. They ask anybody want to join the airborne, you get twice the money. And I stepped out, three or four of us, and, and I said, well, I always made a joke out of it. I said, well, I left I left 120th Infantry because of walked one to death. Then I, I went into the airborne and I run that far, so I didn't do too well. <laughs> So where did you uh, step out of line? Where were you at that time? What do you mean, step out of line? Step out of line Oh, that was in Fort Jackson. That was mm -hmm. in Fort Jackson. Mm -hmm. And that's South Carolina? Uh-huh. Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, where did they send you? And how, how long before you volunteered versus when you went? Oh, they went only about two weeks, and they, they, they sent us to, I had ordered to report to, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, to the jump training school. How did you get to that place? I have no idea. I have no idea how I got to uh, Fort Benning. I'm, I suppose they give me a ticket or something to go. I don't know. That's one part I don't remember. By that time, were you in excellent physical condition? Oh, I had to be, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. When and, you got to Fort Benning, and you, however you got there, and you got there, what was your first impression when you stood in line, if that's what you did? What was your first impression of Airborne? Well, uh, first of all, you, you look at the planes flying over and you look at the high towers that you're going to have to jump from and you look at the big old instructor, it looked like a, a muscle man with a, a big shirt on and he'd walk around like Tarzan. 
and you kind of wilt down a little bit. You don't know what you're getting into, you know. And, uh, and then uh, there's no hold up. And then after you were there, you are there. You grab that, where you come on, you grab your bag or whatever you had with you, and you double time. And every time you go to the mess hall, you double time there and you double time back, you know. And you didn't have time to think what's going to happen. It's already happening, you know. And uh, while we were there, it was, uh, I always, uh, I always used the system in, uh, within myself. If it's man in front of me can do it, I can do it. You know, I, I guess that's what led me on, you know. If, if this guy over here can do it, I can do it, you know. And so I went through, a, we used to jump from towers of that, uh, 40 foot and there was nothing but sawdust below. And you, but they, You'd have to jump and tumble. That they teach you. You hit and tumble. You hit and tumble. You know. Jump and, off a tower forty feet high. Yeah, and, and the sawdust. And, and the, then they had what they call the shock harness. That was the scary thing. It was two hundred fifty foot up, and they would take a fifteen foot, take fifteen foot riser line, not a riser, but a, the, the wide line. I forgot what you call it now. They fold it up on your back and hook it into a hook it into a, a hook in your back and it was 15 foot long and then they'd pull you up you would be flat on your stomach and they'd pull you up flat like this up 250 foot and when you hit the top it would snap and you and you would come down 15 foot and that thing would catch you and swing you like this back on the forward then, you, then they'd bring you back down I made a mistake because when you when they pull me up there, and when I released during that fifteen foot call uh, fall from coming down, I had to uh, count one, two, three, you know, and I counted and nothing come out <laughs> like this, you know. You, hey, you, go back up again. So I had to go up this time. I, I, I sound off that last time though. Let me tell you, that's what they call a shock harness. That was bad. I, Get off your knees or shaking. <laughs> Did you do it more than once? Just that one time. You qualify then, you're all right, you know. But there was so much you had to do, then uh, you had so little time to take it up and, and uh, you'd go out of all planes, and uh, then you had to pack your own parachute. Had to pack your own parachute, and then you, you would, and, and when you're practicing, you would, we had a big joke there. We you practice, you had a parachute full of sawdust. When you get up in the plane, you get up in the plane, that's crazy, boys. Uh, you have to check the men in front of you. And when you're 16 men in line in C-47, and you have to check the man in front of you. We used to, uh, you tap the boy and it says, what's that sawdust doing in coming out of your bag here? You know, and it was, it was actually, it would be silk. He's up there scared anyway. And you, you make him think he's got a little sawdust bag. I said, it used to be a, a joke with us. And, uh, but uh, it was, uh, like I say, uh, one person could do it, the rest of us could. That's the way we, that's the way everybody felt at that time. If you can do it, I can do it. Can you tell me about your instructors there at Benning? Yeah, the meanest people in the world. One of them named Flash Gordon. And, uh, you know, colonels and uh, majors and everyone else had to go through that training. And I've seen him take colonel by the seat of the pants and make him go up and down more. And one time uh, uh, there was uh, one boy they were chewing chewing gum or something he made him take a twig of his hair and, and skip around the field back again because he was chewing chewing gum while trying to give out and uh, trying to receive instruction. It was, it was none of today's army let me put you that way. Yeah. Were you trained on any particular weapon at Benning? Oh yeah I was trained in infantry weapons the, the 60 millimeter mortar then they were trained on the uh, uh, then it was a uh, I don't even, I don't know if we had the, the M1 at that time or not I believe we did had the M1s then we had the O3 rifle before that the five five uh, uh, clip boat action you push it down and you pull a knob and, you, and I believe that was the old Springfield I'm not sure but it was a uh, I fired it too. It it was the most accurate. It was more accurate than the M1 was, but it was a 
you, you start firing it on the on the uh, on the firing line. The time you got through, you've been slid back about three foot. You know, and you have to crawl back up again. You know. Which was your um, weapon that you hoped to have? Well, I I like the M1 because it was automatic or semi-automatic. In other words, uh, and it was a uh, I believe I believe it's an eight round clip you put in them, and uh, so it was a it was a good weapon. And, was a, the best one to have. I, I believe they come in with a M16 and all that stuff later on during the war. I had no parts of that, and we had the Browning automatic uh, pistol. Well, it was a rifle, but it was a had a drum on it and spray with it. But it was not accurate. It was a it was just spray everything, you know, with it. And you use those too, or you just practice? Yeah, I had one of those uh, when I got hit up in uh, Baston. I was carrying a a BAR. No, it wasn't a BAR. It was a Brownie automatic. Uh, Thompson submachine. Thompson sub, yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me about your first jump that you had while training. Mm -hmm. Well, the first jump, the first jump I made, it was um, we pack your own chute. And you know, and and I was really worried because the apex of the chute is tied to the the back to a backpack, and it has a I forgot how many hundred pounds strength that thing, and they make you wrap that thing round and round and round. I, I said, here I am, I weigh a hundred and thirty pound. When in the world can I jump and break that thing and, and probably hold up five hundred pounds? You know, I had me worried, but. Um, I guess it was a blast from the prop on the plane or something. Those things would snap just like that every time. And it had me worried because I thought it was going to drag me around up, up there, you know. I had, but after you do it a time or two, it's fine. It, uh, it pulls the chute out of the backpack. And, uh, and the backpack is it, it permanently fastened to you. So I was thinking, how in the world, I got a 500 pound strength string there hold, uh, between me and that parachute and it's going to break. I was wondering how that was going to work, you know. But it worked. It worked, you know. How did it feel being up in that airplane tightly packed with, what, 16 other guys? Yeah. It scared to death, as usual. And when they called you to stand up? Yeah. Well, it isn't. Actually, it's like anything else. The waiting is the worst part. You. You you go down there. We're going to jump tomorrow, you see, and you start sweating. So you go down there and you sit at the airfield and sit at the airfield maybe half a day. And then say, well, they call it off. We come back tomorrow, you know. And uh, you wish you just go ahead and get it over with, you know. And uh, it's uh, actually anybody that don't get scared of it. It's crazy, as far as I'm concerned, you know. So you don't have to be scared. You have to be really concerned, you know, because I know my uh, second jump, the boy in front of me, I checked his equipment, and he fell 1,500 foot, and didn't nothing open. He hit the ground and bounced high of this house. You know, boy, I always remember, he was, I don't remember his name, but it was Columbus, Ohio. I checked his equipment, and it was perfect, and it was still intact when he hit the ground. I don't know what happened. Did you, know? you see him bounce? Oh, yeah. He, Bounce and when he hit the ground, his parachute flew open like that. It busted, you know, when he hit the ground. But uh, what they do to have you overcome something like that, it made every one of us in that plane load up and go make another jump right then. Uh, psychology, I guess, or something. I guess we figured you'd wait till the next day or something. You'd... And we lost a few uh, different times that just couldn't take it no more. Did anybody blame you for that accident? No, it was. Uh, they looked at everything, and everything was perfect. It just didn't open. They don't know why. He may even forgot to hook up at the end. That was something. Cause you got sixteen men pushing each other like this and sliding your riser down, you know. And uh, he might have just forgot to hook up or something. I don't. Or maybe he didn't fasten his uh, his strong string to it so it would pull the chute out. I don't know. Did you um? Make any, uh, uh, did anybody try to convince you to get out of that airborne unit? No, my, uh, 
my mama, she naturally mama's worried about everything. She was really worried about it. And I said, Mom, it's no worse than when you go on maneuvers, it's no worse than trucks going and running over people in the in the tents and all that stuff. I says, It's everything's dangerous but uh but they take all the precautions. So I take I told her, I said, I'll take you out to Fort Bragg. We're gonna make a jump out there and uh, and uh, she, she she up and we made a what we call a division jump and it was beautiful ever everything and she come back and said, Well my goodness this so that looked like fun. So if I had a man, I might want to do that. And she never was worried no more about it, you know. When you made that fifth jump. Yeah, well, it was so many jumps. It was after I had qualified and went and transferred back to Fort Bragg. When you made that fifth jump and you became a paratrooper yeah. and got mm -hmm. your wings, yeah. mm -hmm. what did you do? Well, then they took us and formed the 101st Airborne Division. What did you do when you got your wings? Do you remember that day? I know I was real proud of it. I don't. All of us got them at one time when we were in the, all the instructors and everything relaxed, and we all went to the PX and had cokes and everything, and everybody was happy. Nobody was mad at anyone then, you know. And uh, it's like uh, when you graduate from school, you know, you're not mad at the teacher no more, you know. So the way it is. <laughs> and and then you went back to Fort Bragg. Yeah, we, we formed the 101st Airborne Division, and and we went back to Fort Bragg. You and, remember about what year that would have been? Oh, it must have been 43, I'd say. Early 43? Uh-huh, and uh, we went in where the old 9th Division used to be in the wooden barracks there. Is that when you really joined a squad and company and platoon? Yeah, well, that's when I, I become a, a member of... A, Company G, 101st Airborne Division, right then. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, we took some hard training in the competition there on uh, uh, runs and on carrying equipment and who could uh, make five mile trip the fastest and all that stuff. And every morning, every Monday morning, you'd have to a uh, double time seven miles. Uh, other mornings are, is there only five miles, and uh, we thought we were tough, and I guess we were. We had a good time. Boys. Who but, was your commander in, in Company G? Oh, I had several of them. One that you remember? Uh, let's see. Uh, Captain Clemens was one. Uh, First sergeant Odom was my first sergeant. Uh, got to Europe and born in Clobstead or something. I believe a man named I believe took over and my my commander got promoted to the staff of major and I forgot who he who that last one was. But uh, but at Fort Bragg, mm -hmm. uh, who was the man who led your 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 people? If you had to pick one man that sticks out as your leader, he might not be the commander, but... Uh. Oh, we well, had <clears throat> my platoon sergeant, Kent, red-headed sergeant, was uh, my platoon leader. Then I had a sergeant, Gorman, was a squad leader. Can you tell me about these men? Yeah, both of them are dead. They got killed in Normandy, both of them. And, uh, I felt real bad about uh, Sergeant Gorman because uh, he he got married and had a, a child in federal. He, I don't think he'd ever seen it, and uh, and uh, it's a that's a sad story about him. I don't know if I should tell it or not, you know, because uh, there in Carrington uh, he got shot, and uh, I don't know if you want to. He got shot. We'll get back to him when we get to Carrington. Uh, yeah. Tell me um, when you boarded ship to head over to England. Oh, that's a sore subject. Do I have to tell that? We uh, we went up from here. Somehow, a train, I suppose, we went up to New York. We got on a, a boat. This is going to make you laugh. But the boat was tied up at the dock, and I got seasick. I'd never been on nothing besides a rowboat before. 
And uh, but I come to find out later, it wasn't that at all. It was an old English, old English boat ship, real old, the Strathnever. Strathnever was the name of it. And they just had painted all paint. I, I don't know how you spell it, so. Uh, Strathnever. Yeah, but it was an English ship, a real old one. And uh, we uh, we got on that thing. And all of our equipment crowded into the room and on and everywhere else that we could get. And I got sick as a dog, but all the rooms and everything there were uh, just freshly painted. You smell real oil paint, real strong, and I believe that's what happened. Anyway, uh, people were laughing at me. I said, "Well, I never been in nothing no bigger than a rowboat. Don't laugh at me, you know." But you know, we lucked out with that old ship. We uh, we took off. I don't know what day it was, we took off to go to, uh, to Europe. And that daggone thing, all the engines knocked off of it but one. And we were dropped behind the convoy. And uh, we stayed uh, way back behind. And uh, they had to take one destroyer and stay with us. And we come so close that, uh, that uh, they made us up at, off the coast of Halifax. Nova Scotia, and it comes so close that uh, they made all of us be quiet, and they dropped death guard charges that destroyed it. That's how close we come, and the the, the ships would vibrate like this when they, they go up. And uh, and uh, finally we got into the Halifax Bay there, and uh, we changed over to a John Harrison American ship after about three or four days there. And, uh, you didn't see any subs. No, didn't see anything. And uh, but uh, we found out later that during that when they were bombing, we had fifteen hundred more people on that old, that old English ship than we had life preservers for. We were sleeping on the decks and everything. And we found out later they had fifteen hundred people more than they had life preservers for, and and they were doing that. Kind of feel lucky, you know. But the funny part, I guess it's the funny part, but I was an old country guy. I, I got over to got over to London, uh, to Liverpool, and, uh, and uh, for about a week I would go this way, I'd walk this way, and I'd walk this way, just like ship rocking, you know. And, uh, and, and I was laughing so much, I said, don't feel bad, that's the way I feel too. It took me about a week to get over. You know, it's a real crazy thing, you know. But it's, that's the way life was back there. When did you, where did you land? I think it was Liverpool, the best I remember. It was Liverpool. And we got on trains and went to a little town named Hungerford. Hungerford? Mm-hmm. That's, that's about, uh, I guess it's about 70, 80 miles from London. How long did you stay at Hungerford? We stayed there, uh, we stayed there till we, uh, we left there and, and uh, went out to Airfield, uh, Newberry, Newberry, the name of the airfield, and we got on our planes there, and that's where uh, I met General Eisenhower come and talk to us, come down the line, come down the line talking to us, and we were ready, packed up, ready to go out, ready to make the jump. Did you see him? Oh personally? yeah, he talked to me. He said, son, well, he, he come to me and said, son, says, where are you from? I said, North Carolina. He said, what your, what your parents do? I said, they're farmers. He said, you will be plowing tonight. <laughs> That's all he said. He stepped the next man and kept going, you know. And, but I've met all those, all of those. Oh, I, I met, when we first were mobilized, uh, uh, General Marshall came to Fort Bragg, uh, Fort uh, Jackson to see us, and uh, he was a two or three star general at that time. And, uh, anyway, we weren't allowed to even look at him, hardly. He's so big. But uh, I don't remember all these things. I get kind of mixed up in it, but it all happened. While you were in Hungerford, did you do more training? Oh, yeah. We made jumps there. And uh, we, uh, backing up a little bit, when I was at Fort Bragg, we made a night jump for, uh, who is it, what's his name, uh, in uh, England, uh, D. 
The old man? Patton? Patton? Who? George Patton? No, the, I mean the, the German, uh, I mean the, uh, oh, see, I, I have the... The Prime Minister, you mean? Yeah. Um, the Ch Churchill. Yeah, it was Churchill. We we made a night jump for Churchill uh, in uh, there at Fort Bragg. I forgot what night that was on. I always remember it because I come down and my feet hit on the top of the ambulance and my neck's head hitting in the black jack oaks way over tumbling and the wind shifted on us, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he's glad to get on the ground. Nothing hurts. How did you d handle the English population when you were over in England? I, I thought it was a... Uh, I thought it was... Uh, I must have saluted the uh, fire chiefs uh, one, uh, with uh, bus drivers and everything else because they were uniform in the world was there. I looked back and, and I was just a, a young squirt and I saluted everything that moved almost. And uh, you know, it, was, it, was a, it was a good time because I went to London several times and I uh, went to Cardiff, Wales and up in uh, Scotland and come back from... Uh, when we come back from uh, the first jump, they give us uh, some pay and let us go to where we wanted to for seven days. And uh, I, I, I went out in London, I went on Piccadilly Surface and Leicester Square, and I sat on the steps and watched the big bins or whatever. I was excited about that big clock, you know, and uh, just a young squirt. And was, uh, it was a good time. Of course, I never seen London in the daytime. Everything was boarded up, and, and uh, but there was. Uh, I always remember the place I went to uh, was a. Uh, there was a three floors, big warehouse thing, and there was a band on uh, each floor, and it was full of boys and girls. Uniforms I never even seen before. All colors of people, and and everybody having a good time. You know, it's a. Uh, and I guess that's keep morale going. I don't know what else, but I remember those those times. Let's stop there. We're running out of tape. Okay. We're on the landing strip. Uh -huh. You had just talked to Ike. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you did right next? Well, what we did, we started. Uh, of course, we were we uh, were brief the last brief section there. And then we waited around, and then uh, we began to load on the planes. And uh, we rode on the planes, uh, and it was uh, that same night. And uh, we uh, we got on the plane in uh, OC-47, and uh, and here we went. And I can remember the moon shining. I could look down from the plane. I could see uh, all kind of boats and things down there. And it's out of a... Uh, they come out of Torquay, Torquay, England, I believe, was the name of the base or port or something down there. Torquay is in Eng southern England, and uh, and I never seen so many people. But we we flew over, and uh, and uh, all of a sudden uh, uh, the plane turned like this, and and, uh, and I could look at the other planes. Then I saw the flak starting up. From all over, and a little plaque popping, you see a little waggy hole come in the plane, lit and all that stuff, you know. And I was wanting to get out of there. And the young pilots were inexperienced, evidently, because they started coming down. And I was a, the cleanup man, they called it. I was last in line. And uh, so, what happened, time, uh, time it comes to my time to jump, I looked, and it was about, probably about 10 minutes to one, I had on a, a watch. And uh, uh, come I got on the ground, I uh, he was so close to the ground that I only swung about twice, and I hit the ground. I didn't hit the ground; I hit a tree. What happened? I came down, and uh, I came down, and uh, my 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 shoe hit in a tree, and I come underneath, and it was a, a fruit tree, an apple tree, or something like that, you know. And uh, and I was all by myself out in this orchard type thing, you know. And, oh man, where am I? And my I, uh, my helmet come down, hit me in the nose. My nose was bleeding, and my back hurt. And uh, so anyway, uh, 
I heard this terrible noise coming, and man, I got out of that chute, and I crawled over the edge as much as I could, and uh, I got a famous name from that, too. They called me the sheep man after that, because what it was, these bunch of sheep had got herded up and scared, and they were coming down through that field, through that pasture, and I got on my hands and knees, and I, was, I, was, I, I, I went right among all those things until I got over to the edge, <laughs> and I rolled over. I rolled over there into the hedgerow, and, and there was a ditch there, and I crawled down in that thing and pulled a brush in behind me, and I stayed in there until it got daylight because uh, you're roaming around out there. You don't know what you're going to run into, and I, I went to, uh, I, I stayed in there, and, and I didn't even see any more GI until it got daylight the next day. I was by myself, so I'd be an old farm boy. I knew how to, to hide anyway, and that's what I did. I hid until I make sure I'd look around and they have the little snappers they were giving us but uh, it didn't take long for uh, Germans to take one away from a man that got killed and he used it you know so I I just uh, then there's four or five of us got together the next morning and uh, eventually in about about the next day after that it was about eight or ten twelve of us and we got in fact I got uh, my back had a fracture inside and my nose broken from hitting that tree and and uh, he pinned a purple heart on me, not a purple heart but a, a tag. He filled it out and he supposed to turn that in and get a purple heart uh, if you wanted or whatever back there. And uh, so uh, I got to look and he was from the 82nd Airborne Division. He wasn't even in my division. I don't know how we got and we were something like five or six miles from where we were supposed to be. During that night that you were hiding for about four hours till daylight, did you uh, uh, did you see anything, anybody, anything? I, I I just see that I was look I was looking up at all the planes that were coming down. Some of the fire, some was getting shot, and, and and people were jumping, but nobody come close to me, you know. So, uh, well, see, it was it was uh, about after one o'clock then. It wasn't long to daylight, you know. So about four hours, like you say, then. But I stayed right there, and I just sit in there and pull that stuff out on me, and and it got a little light, and I heard some boys, some boy, uh, GI talking about uh, something about two or three of them in them, and uh, I got to make sure it was, and then I called them and told them I was over here, and they said, okay, come on, and I come out, and it was uh, four or five of them. Some of them I didn't, I never seen before. I don't know who they were. Were they hiding also? No, they they were. They had come from somewhere. I don't know where they had been, but they come from somewhere. But uh, there's no way you could uh, get out there and shoot everything that moved that night. And they give us orders: if you take any prisoners, you stand guard over them. So nobody was taking any prisoners the first night, you know. So. So you didn't shoot your gun on that first night. Sir, I didn't even. I had it ready, but that's all. I didn't shoot my gun that, that first night. What gun did you have at that time? That was an M1, and uh, it was in a, and you, you'd have to take it, it was put in a, uh, it wasn't loose or anything, it was put in a package, in two pieces, you have to take it out and put it together, you know, and uh, I put it together and put the ammunition in it, and, and I was ready, <coughs> I was ready, but uh, I didn't want to go out there and uh, make any noise or anything else until I could see, until I could see what I was doing, you know. Did any of these five guys that you got together with were they with your unit? They were with my division, but uh, but uh, and some of them were, were from the eighty second division. And uh, finally, we we uh, a few few days later we started to gang together, and uh, and uh, last count I had it was about fourteen or fifteen of us, and uh, we finally got enough together that uh, that uh, we uh, started the Battle of Carrington. You know. Was that the very first time you yep. went into combat then? Yeah. Uh -huh. At Carrington? Uh -huh. Well, I'd seen a lot of dead German and dead Americans along the way, but the uh, first time I got to where I was having to use my rifle was in Carrington. When you saw your first dead person, what went through your mind? The first dead person I saw was a German officer. I guess he was an officer. But what always stuck in my mind, he was laying there in a dress uniform with his feet 45 degree angle, looked like he was sitting in a, laying in attention. 
and uh, then uh, I found some GIs that were this is a little rough. GIs were hung with barbed wire in the courtyard there, and uh, blood run uh, had run down and puddled, and uh, I kind of got sick, and you know. I don't even like to talk about those things too much, you know. You mean hung around their neck? Oh, yeah. Like execution? Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, uh, from then on, I didn't mind shooting one, you know. From then on, it was uh, me or him, so. So, it was a, it's a funniest thing, though. Uh, there, there are two or three things that's funny in combat like that. It's a, uh, you, like a, you, you don't know what to do or when to do, or, uh, it, but you have to figure your way out of it. You know, I, I, I get confused in the way I think about it sometimes. But uh, I know uh, one experience I had, I, I would like to find out if that German lives today. If it is, I'd like to see him. Before we went to Carrington, we were in these blasted hedgerows, and the, the road's there. We're so deep down the top of a car or something was even with the top of the... And uh, I know this, he started popping this uh, dirt, hit me in the face uh, when I had scooped some dirt in front of me, and, and I did the same thing for him. And I don't know, this, this is the weirdest thing that ever happened to me. I said, well, that boy's going to get me sooner or later. I'm going to get him. So I, I jumped out of that hole and jumped down and, and down in that road. And he did the same thing, exactly the same time as I did. And we were both standing there like that, looking at each other. He turned white as a sheet, and so did I. I turned around and run back up the hill, and he did the same thing. Never fired a shot at either one of us. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I'd I like to know if he lived. I'd like to run into him again, you know. We didn't either one fire a shot. But uh, seen some terrible things. When you went into Carantan... And you were ready to use your rifle. Yeah. Uh, can you describe what happened? Well, what happened? We uh, we were going to, as you know, the uh, they had flooded all the fields and everything there, and we we had to uh, we had to cross, and it was a uh, a bridge had blown out. It was about from here to the road out there, I suppose, and there was this armed reinforcement rods across, you know. And we uh, we got up there, and we had to cross that thing. But uh, the only way you cross it is hand over hand, right? so you couldn't walk it or anything. So we had to cross that thing. And uh, I know a poor guy in front of me, he went over there and got about halfway, and he hit, dropped and went out of sight. And I never did see him. I don't know what happened to him. Was it a deep river or uh, yeah, far down? Well, it all had come together like this, you know, and it was running, see. And it was a, like a, a big flooded lake that it all come together at this point. And uh, so, uh, and then it was a big lake on the other side. Was so, he shot and fall, or did he just fall? No, he just slipped or He couldn't hold on. And uh, so I guess I did dirty. I was carrying a thirty caliber machine gun. I told... I told the boy behind me, you carry that thing, I can't make it. And I just, I reached up there and got that thing. I started catwalking that thing right across there. Because at home, I had a good experience. We used to walk around our tobacco barns on those things like that, you know, those seals. And I, had, I was about 130 pounds of leather back in those days, I guess. And, uh, but that old boy, when I was born, I don't know who it was. He dropped in there and he didn't even bubble. He just went right down. And I don't know who he was. And then my, uh, a little further up on that same road, my platoon leader got shot strafed with a bullet when the, a plane come down like this and strafed him. And his name was uh, Lieutenant Jones, red-headed, uh, red-headed lieutenant. Was that our plane or their plane? It was their plane. And uh, so uh, he, got, he got shot and hit in the back and, uh, and I run up and his bubbles coming out. Bubbles were coming out of his back. I, I was a young kid. I didn't know nothing to do it. I just pulled up. I had a whole thing on the side, a old band, bandage thing. I just wrapped it around him and tied it hard as I could. And I got a, I got a, a, a medal for that. And I didn't even know 
and I didn't know what I was doing. And that day, he come back with my platoon leader again. Now, was on. it during the daytime or evening? It was in the daytime, yeah. And, uh, and you still hadn't fired your weapon? Oh, yeah, we fired it. But what we did, we uh, we were we were crossing them. They'd, they'd have us to lay down fire as we moved up, you know, sweep fire out to the right, and those on that side would sweep to the left, you know, as we were approaching Carrington. And uh, then we made a big mistake, and I don't know if it was from, uh, but we uh, that was late in the afternoon, so we waited till the next morning, and it was like the old cavalry way back in those days. We got up and made a charge across that open field, hollering and shooting, you know, and uh, and uh, we made a mistake because uh, because during the night they had brought reinforcements in over there, and man, they were cutting us loose. That's where Sergeant Gorman got killed over there, and uh, uh, and uh, they just would mourn us down, so we took off and run back and got behind them back again because we we just started and they started shooting us we did we had a mound we uh edge of a ditch or something that we got behind and and uh, but they got a few of us anyway so but my colonel battalion commander colonel robert cole from texas he got a congressional medal for that attack and uh, it was uh well i don't say anything other than that it was a, he got a congressional medal out of it because we charged there, and but uh, we finally got some relief there. But that was an unsuccessful charge, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah almost. He got some people killed. I, I didn't want to. You know, I, it was the oddest thing. I saw one boy after we finally got over there the next day. We we went anyway after that that day. We got some artillery finally, and uh, there's one boy. It run across the place. You know, it was like a, you go there and here and over, and you go straight across. Well, I, I went around that way. He run straight across, and that poor guy hit a mine or something. And it was a, it was almost like a silhouette thing. He, he was, he was just like this in the air, and he, he just stood there. Now with didn't move. He just stood there like a statue. I guess it was a pressure or something, and uh, it was a really amazing. And uh, that's where I felt so bad about Sergeant Gorman, though. It's, tell me, can you tell me about him? Yeah, he he was back there, almost behind the hill with us, and some stray bullet got him, I guess, and just cut his head open, you know. And his brains and all were coming down, down here, and everything running. Right and he was he was out of his mind, hard, and, uh, kill me, go ahead and kill me, go ahead and kill me, and finally he just. You know, and, and I've always felt bad. Something I got to get to you, man. I just got my whole cry, you know. You know, it's, I knew him. He'd been my squad leader for years. It seemed like, I don't know why this happened, but almost every one of those boys, like Sergeant Kent, Sergeant Gorman, they would take a break. They'd pull a little Bible out and would read it. It seemed like all the good people, you know, no good people like me got by. It seemed like all those people were the ones, you know. I don't understand that at all. It bothered me. Did and you actually ever see bullets hit folks? Do what? Did you there at Carantan, did you see the enemy bullets hit your people? Oh yeah. Or just what happened oh, yeah. afterwards? Oh yeah. He just uh one boy was uh crossed along in front of me and he got hit and uh and uh I, I reached up and got him, I said, You better sit down before you get before you get it and he didn't say anything and I reached and pulled him down Half of his whole back of his head was gone. He was sitting there, sitting up there, just looked staring, you know. And it's, uh, I dream about it. After talking about it, I'm going to dream about it again tonight. I about got over it, you know. But uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. You uh, mentioned that you were wounded at Carrington. Yeah, I, I, was, I was wounded with a shell fragment. It, uh, it was just a scar here. I got a scar here. When did that happen? How did it happen? Well, it was a, an explosion of some kind. I don't know. We, it, we, with artillery, it might have been one of our own. Uh, I, I don't know. It was just uh, an explosion and, uh, and a sort of blood running down my arm. And it was, uh, wasn't bad. It wasn't bad enough to, uh, except they'd go to aid station. They bandaged it up and let me go. 
in the, Where did you go after they let you go? Well, I, I went right back to the Union. You know, How went, far away was the aid station? Well, it was, it was in the back, and they kept moving. As you move, they move, you see. And, uh, of course, they had a they had such a, a problem with uh, picking up the dead and all that stuff, the big truckloads of people out there, shoveling people in those, uh, uh, taking people, throwing up like cordwood in the... It was, uh, if the news people were there, they had a ball. But uh, it was uh, it was real horrible. And I still dream about a lot of it. Now, some days I get depressed on account of it. And it's been how many years now? Sixty? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. When you uh, entered Caritan was, and the fighting had ceased, did you see any German prisoners? No, I didn't. I didn't go all the way into Carrington because uh, we we were relieved. About the time we started into, we were relieved. And they pulled us back, and uh, they pulled us back and organized us and sent us back to uh, and sent us back to uh, England again. How long were you in combat in Car uh, in Normandy? About a month, I'd say, three weeks or a month. And about how many of those days did you really see the bad stuff happening? About two weeks, I'd say. About half that time. And uh, and I mean, I mean, when you all, uh, you call it the front line, we call it the front line. You keep people coming up, and you go back, and you go back, and then, you know, and uh, it was a. Uh, then we really hadn't got a. It was a month before all of our unit got together while we was alive, and uh, we uh, got on the ship and went back to uh, went back to England again. And from there, we made another jump up into Holland. Did you uh, in Normandy? Did you have to attack any armor? No, no. Did you have any armor on your side helping you defend? Well, or see, attack? we were airborne unit. We didn't have uh, have that stuff until. The, few days later before they could come in on the beach. But they did have it with some of your attacks, like it Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we were, we would have suffered pretty much if we, uh, we suffered pretty much if the beach landing hadn't got in there when they did. And uh, that beach landing was uh, really messed up. It was really bad. When you were hit in the arm, did it hurt? Did it sting? Or can you remember? It, it always just stink like a burn. Almost, and it was bleeding. It's, a, it's not a very big, not a very big place. It's, uh, it's, uh, so see, you see a scar here. You see the scar there. Right. About grown up now. It wasn't bad, but I wouldn't get on my face. Tell me about the a uh, couple of months of rest back in England before we made the second jump. Well, we, we, back there, we took just as, uh, we, uh, what we did, we come back there and they give us, I think it was three months pay or something like that. Uh, and we, in the bridge, I went over to Carter, who was trained up to Scotland. And, uh, we made a, I think we made one or two night jumps there. And then uh, it wasn't long flying over to Holland and making that. Jump. Did you see any entertaining shows while you were in England? Uh, the only thing I saw was um, uh, let's see, not in England. It was somewhere. Uh, what's his name? A little little fella. Come on, I can't think of his name. I think today I have a Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney come over and was dancing on the back end of a truck one time, something. But uh, uh, but there was uh, nothing, uh, no, no big entertainment, nothing like that. After being in combat for a month and then being pulled out, uh, how did you feel about making a second jump? Well, we were. I don't know. Can you cut that off a minute? Right. Now I just ask you about getting ready for your second jump. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when you made your first jump, did you have a mission to accomplish that night? Yes, we uh, <clears throat> we were to we could stall the enemy and confuse the enemy. Uh, so the beachhead, so the beachhead. Our, our, we were to come to the beachhead, and the beachhead was supposed to come to us. If you understand what I'm saying here, right? Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And but we we jumped in the wrong place. It was no, it, it was no fault laid to anybody. We lost so much equipment coming in off, coming into the beach, the heavy equipment. It was uh, only found out later that we had flotation tanks, and uh, out of I believe it was 31, only two. They put them in the water, and they landed at the wrong place. And it went on the angle. They they were not straight into the beach where I guess. But when the tanks, when the tanks come in, the flotation, the wave just flipped them all over. They were, and uh, I think uh, there was maybe three out of the thirty got in. That's why our our support we call it artillery support, which was a uh, our most important weapon. You know. And that was a, a problem there, and the problem was that uh, I imagine the weather, and and I often wonder why they didn't take those big guns on the uh, those big guns on the ships. I often wonder why they didn't take those blast that whole bank, that whole uh, parts of the boards. How to go and take those. Uh, Pill box and everything by themselves. I mean, it hadn't that been, uh, they could have leveled that whole place. In fact, when I come back, when I come back from Carrington, coming back, it looked like um, what us old country folk call a new ground. It looked like there's many shells and bums fell. It looked like the whole woods there were just like this. But uh, right on the right on the bank itself, it was intact. And I don't. I never did understand that, or why they just didn't level that that place that we supposed to, the troops supposed to come in. I believe it was the 29th Division supposed to come in there. That Omaha B. Uh huh. And uh, and they just uh, they didn't. Uh, I don't know if it was a mistake, or they meant to do it, or they just didn't do it, or or that's the way it was planned. I don't know, but. Uh, did but you have a Did you have a personal mission to accomplish? No, no personal. Uh, the only personal thing I did was to go in, jump inland, and and form up and and meet the beachhead people. Okay. And we're gonna put squeeze play on them if you want to put it that way. And uh, and it was uh, it was everything was difficult. A little bit didn't go the way we would like for it to go, but. Uh, it might have paid off in the long run because we confused the enemy as much as we were confused because they threw out dummies and uh, <laughs> they threw out dummies and all this stuff trying to confuse the people and we uh, and uh, I guess it worked because they didn't know where we were coming from they didn't know where we were coming in the beach and and the high class German uh, I mean the the real important Germans uh, they thought we were you know, coming across up there. At, that nearest place, what is it? I can't think of it. the nearest place across the channel. Calais. Calais. They thought we were coming across there because we had dummy people on, on the other side, double tank. No, they thought we were going to come in. Hitler still thought we were going to come in there. He said that's only a bluff coming into Normandy. But you had no clue of that at, at that no, time. No, uh, not that. How many days were you on in Normandy before you? Attack. I'd I'd say it was a bit. You mean before? Before you attacked at Carrington. Oh, we were in there. We were in there. I I made it was a. As soon as we got enough together, we didn't have all our people together. We just had whoever we could get, and uh, and uh, we. Uh, I made it about two weeks, maybe three at the most. You know, I don't know exactly. Back then, a private, he didn't know nothing anyway. He didn't suppose know nothing, take care of himself, you know. But between Carrington and the day you dropped, or the night you dropped, you didn't 
didn't see any action. You were uh, just trying to organize. Uh, you mean the time that we dropped to Karen? Well, yes, we uh, we uh, had to uh, clean out hedgerows and uh, had to uh, uh, had to. Uh, had to, we tried to find our other people were a major right. problem then. Nobody said so, but I know that's what it was. We we uh, we tried to organize and re, uh, reorganize, get all of our people together. We, well, we kept doing that until we got uh, we got a pretty good supply of them, and then we we organized and, and went into Carrington, which was uh, I imagine maybe two weeks. I'm not sure. I don't know. It's uh, back in those days. Uh, I can't remember the times. Uh, took to do this or do that, you know. When when you were getting ready for your second drop, ultimately in Belgium and Holland, mm -hmm. um, were you given a mission then? Yeah, our mission was to uh, stop stop the people that Patton was running across the canals there. And, I, and there was a, we, uh, we stopped, uh, we jumped into there. In fact, the colonel had got the Congressional Medal he, he got killed there, Colonel Cole. Uh, he got killed there, and uh, it was a, it was so they were running across that, they were running people across that. It, it was something like uh, that. We had so many prisoners, we had them in a field, and we had to have a little small artillery pieces, those hand pieces we call them, uh, and, and in four corners pointing towards them. We didn't have enough people to guard them, where Patton was running them across the. Uh, uh, run them across the, the canal there. Can and you it, tell me about loading up for that mission in comparison to loading up for um, the Normandy drop? It was in the daytime. All of that was in the daytime. Uh, and uh, the, the Normandy drop was nighttime. This was in the daytime and uh, and we didn't uh, we didn't even get shot at or nothing in the planes going over on that one. And when you jumped out the plane were you in last in line again? Yeah, and we we all landed on the field and where we're supposed to. I think I saw one C forty seven that had to land something wrong with the engine. I mean, he skidded it on there, and and the women and children and everything without grabbing our parachutes away from us. <laughs> they like that silk, you know. We you get out of that thing and run, but uh, but uh, there were there were a lot of people got a lot of people got killed there uh, because uh. It was so confused that they were running them across the, uh, Patton was running them across that canal and, and we were a small unit there trying to stop them, you know, and uh, we didn't have any big stuff. So eventually, uh, I heard this tank coming, I thought, oh Lord, we've had it now. And uh, and some British stuck his head out and said, hey Yank, can I help you? And man, I was so glad to see that, and he come inspiring that swinging that thing around and firing and the people come out of the woods their hands stuck up all over the place you know and and I was sure glad to see that young man I don't know who he was but I thank him to this day and uh, I know some my partner I don't even know his name now but he was in a slit trench we call it then over there uh, and, and, and he was right next to me and I was talking to him and I was ten foot away and back on Sniper got him right between their eyes. He started to say something to me in a little bluish black hole come up between his eyes, you know. He just went, man, I, I fell back in that hole of mine and I hollered, medic, medic, medic. And uh, he, he just looked at me and just shook his head and turned around and left, you know. It's funny how people are selected to get killed like that, you know. I don't know if it was a tree or in a way of me or not, you know. But it was a uh, and the body it just stayed there in your a, hole. It was a horrible thing. And, and my Colonel Cole got killed. The last time I seen him, he was in a, a box hole and his feet sticking straight up in the air where somebody just, he just dropped in it, I guess, or something, you know. And that other body was just stayed there in your hole? Yeah, when he's in the, his hole. They they got him out and, uh, later on because we had already won the battle there and, and the, the rear echelon come in and and police those people up, take them back to uh, aid station. The aid station would wrap them in something and line them up. And uh, I guess they flew them out, or I don't know how they left from there. Was there a time that you saw somebody to shoot at and you shot at them? Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know. Uh, uh, there was no time that I shot at a man and killed him as far as I know of. Pick, I come close. Uh, there was three of us at a building, and 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 that was up in uh, not Bear. It was up in uh, up in uh, the snow. What is it? Baston. In Baston. We were in a big building when, uh, and there was three Germans coming up the road, and the, and I and I was in charge, and I told them there's three there, and I marked out which one we would take, let them get so and so, let them get so and so. But thank goodness, though, those three gentlemen turned and went like that. It, we thought they were going to come up to the same building we were in, and we were going to uh, going to have to uh, kill them. But they turned and went out through the woods, and I was so pleased with that, you know. It, it just get, didn't give a man a chance. He'd walk along, they were joking and laughing and carrying on, and it's, I, I, if he was shooting at me, it would be a different story, you know. But... Uh, I told I had three men there, and all, uh, me and two more. I said, "Well, if they come by so and so, you get so and so, I get this one, you get this one." But they turned a minute before that and went out another way, you know. When you were in Belgium, did any other weird things happen in combat? Let's see. When I was there, is uh, not 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 too much. Uh, it was a. Uh, I oh, mean, up in Baston? No, in Belgium. Uh, uh, no, uh, I don't think so. It was a. Uh, it was a. Uh, we come come out of that. We come out of there and went back. Uh, as I remember, and they, and I went to Paris from there. I went to Paris from there. I had to leave, and I went down into Paris. We were in tents. Well, I went down into Paris uh, on a three-day pass. And uh, class A uniform on. And what angered me, we were paratroopers and we were short on boots. And they see the quartermaster boys walk around there with boots. And in fact, the, the girlfriends had on paratrooper boots, you know, and I got a little angry about that. And and when I had to go, when they, they looked me up, and the MPs found me down. I said, Your outfit's moving out. I said, I, And I would just move in there. And uh, and I got back to the I got back to I got the one but one truck left the whole thing was gone, and we uh, we headed for Baston in the trucks you know, and uh, I got up on the front line with the low quarters on, Lord. With your Class A uniform? Yeah, <laughs> I had, I wrapped up in everything I could find, my, I, and uh, all that snow and stuff, and finally I got some boots from the supplies somebody had them I guess somebody got killed and left them or something. I got boots and stuff and finally got my combat gear on. And, uh, Were you able to hook up with your company? Yeah. We went We went up to, uh, went on up to the, uh, the company and we, uh, we went into uh, that truck. Uh, uh, that truck caught another big old truck. One of these, uh, I call them an Air Force truck. Uh, the uh, big old trailer and it only comes up part of the way, you know, and your head sticking out. And uh, and uh, there must have been 40 or 50 of us stacked in those things, headed for Baston, you know. And uh, we got up there, and a, and a shell landed pretty close to us, and a daggone driver stopped the truck, jumped out, and run. And uh, so uh, some somebody went aboard and got in the truck and drove off and left him. I don't know what ever happened to that driver. But... Uh, do you, do you remember being surrounded at that time? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I was a. I had the responsibility of laying uh, panels, uh, plain panels, you know, to indicate to the uh, American uh, we are here. No strafers, you know. They call them colored panels, different colors. And uh, we, uh, me and four people, were responsible for laying those out. And uh, that's where I got to, you know, laying those things out in. I was coming back towards my line in an explosion, and uh, and uh, I woke up in the hospital. But before before that, they were we'd stay there on this outpost thing. It was a sort of a forest thing, and we were had people. We, me and these four men had this particular place here, and the day. Uh, we had enough to eat there, and they killed somebody killed an old cow, a steer or something, 
and, and finally brought us some hot food. They took 20 cents a piece away from our pay, pay for that blasted thing. <laughs> and at night, I, we were starving. At night, I'd crawl out in the, I'd crawl out in the field there, and I'd be an old farmer. I knew the, the raisins and the soil and so on. And, I, and I'd take an, take an old bayonet and old tool scratch it. I'd find these old sugar beets underneath the uh, snow there, and I'd dig those things out. Man, they'd give you stomach ache, but it was food, you know. Yes, sir. But uh, that old, that old, uh, that beat me though, that old ox or whatever they, but it must have fed a hundred people and they got about a half a canteen cup full of soup out of it, you know. It was sort of funny in a way after I got to thinking about it, you know. How was the cold? Do what? How was the cold? I got my feet hurt up there. I, I, I got wounded and the doctor said that I didn't get wounded, I just got knocked out and, uh, and, uh, I don't remember anything except going back. I was I heard uh, I heard all this gra glass rattling, gas rattling, and I woke up in the, and I was up inside uh, top of a big building, and the the bombs were going off and the lights were flashing and everything. But it's funny I couldn't hear, I couldn't I couldn't get nothing organized. In my mind, I, I, all I can remember is a light and all that glass breaking, you know. And finally, they come up there, and undoubtedly, the Corbett had me upstairs, and they were and they were bumming. So they left me, and they went down to the basement or something, because uh, they couldn't have carried me down those steps anyway, I guess. And uh, and finally, they got me and carried me on over to the hospital the next day, and uh, they said I had a big raid on and that night. Is what it was. But it's funny, I guess glass breaking has something to do with you senses when you're half in and half out. But uh, I guess I was lucky because the doctor come in uh, the next morning and he says, how are you? I says, I'm all right, I suppose. He says, thanks for promotion. He, he said, he, I said, why? He said, last night, he said, last night I was lieutenant, today I'm a major. He said, I kept calling him lieutenant all night. <laughs> and uh, he said, you're lucky. He said, you're a lucky booger, huh? I said, I don't feel so lucky. I had my hand was, uh, in here was cut a little bit. And uh, he had it bandaged up and he said that, uh, said that if you'd have been a day late, said he'd lost both of your feet. He said, we've been working on that. And said, they look all right. But said, they were cold hurt. He said, if you'd have stayed on that line another another two days, you'd have lost both of your feet frostbite. So it was... It was sort of luck in a way. I, I, it's funny how things work for you and don't work for you. And, Could uh, you tell before? I mean, before you went in the hospital, that that you your feet were getting well. They were numb, you, you know, up there. Uh, I I woke up in uh, slit drink and uh, and uh, I guess it was Christmas Eve, or close to it, and uh, and I just wiggled like that and it just cracked. I had a little hole where I was breathing and I just raked it off. In the worst part, you couldn't have a fire, you couldn't have anything like that, you know. Did you ever have any chance to go into Bastogne to warm up at all? No, no. Uh -uh. We were in a, in a forest outside of it. We went through Bastogne and, and made a right and go out in the, we out in the pines or something, like a big, I forgot, the, uh, it was a funny little name of a town. I, well, it wasn't a town, it was just a few houses, but, uh, and then, uh, we went through Bastogne and come back to Bastogne on the way back. And, uh, While you were in Bastogne, had you heard anything about Germans killing American prisoners? No, no, I heard about them uh, infiltrating us and in, in, uh, as American soldiers. And uh, well, that's all we heard about. And uh, we heard something about uh, we heard something about uh, some some Germans had killed some Americans. We didn't. Everything you hear, you can't uh, depend on too much, you know. Well, you were in Bastogne. You mentioned those three soldiers walking down the road, and you, you mm -hmm. were going to aim, and you were going to take them out. Yeah. Well, uh, was there any other time that you had clear shot at people that you knew that you were going to kill? I only in gangs. I never picked an individual out. It would be a, a gang, you know, or something. You don't know if you hit them or not. You don't want to know. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't want to know. Were you still using the M1? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what was your supplies like? Besides, you already told me about the food, but how about yeah. ammunition? Well, we, we were running real low, and they, the uh, ample Mexico might below. Be sparing on your ammunition. We don't have any. We don't have it so much. Be sparing on it. And, 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 and of course, then it didn't take long for them to uh, start dropping us stuff. You know, we did all right then. When you, uh, when, when Bastogne was relieved, how uh, did you know what was happening when the reinforcements came? No, when uh, see, I was in the hospital there, and uh, and when I came out, the Bastogne thing was over with. I guess it was. I, I must have been because I came out of the hospital there. I was in about ten days, and uh, I come out, and they sent me back to my company. And uh, when I got there, most of them were strangers, and they said. Well, don't put your bag down. You're going home. You're being transferred. And uh, so you've been here the longest. You get the most points, I think, they went by that or something. Like you've been in battle and, you, and you've been there so long you get points for coming home. In January of 45? Uh, yeah, something like that, you know. And uh, so I, uh, so they transferred me to uh, us, the gang of boys, some of them I didn't even know, to, I believe it was a, uh, 501 parachute regiment, and then and then they uh, made a re repo depot we call it <laughs> people and we got lined up went on the ship I had me a burp gun I had to clip and everything and clean it up and the, and the MP took it away from me when we got on the ship I, and I got on the ship and people and a lot of other people had them had them on there you know a German yeah German burp gun you know it had a long curve and uh, and uh, had you used that in combat, or was no, it just no, a it was a souvenir thing. Yeah. And uh, I, I sort of wish I'd have kept some of my German stuff. When I when I come back, I had two officer dressed officer those nice and going in uniform, bright brass. I give them to my neighbor. I had a swastika and everything on them, and uh, just like my medals, I I let the kids play with them. Half of them been lost and gone. I give them away. I I, I always thought. Well, when they're in the service, they're in the service. When you're out, you're out, you know. And uh, so I, I wish I'd have took good care of them now and, and had them available. When you um, do, you remember what day you were you were transferred and then put on the boat coming back home? Was the war? I was here. Boat? Let's see, VE Day. When was VE Day? It's in June? May May seventh. Yeah. I was here right before then, right before then, as I remember. I was right here, uh, VE Day, as I remember, uh, because I know that uh, or right uh, before then, I don't remember, because I know all, they were, they had big dances and everything for us soldiers coming back, and and, uh, and uh, I think, I don't know, a bunch of girls, a great big hall, and a bunch of girls, were there to dance with you and uh, and all that stuff. And, uh, so you were here on VDE then? Yeah. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. between January, late January and yeah, so, uh, May, yeah. you were uh, in yeah. the Repo Devos? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly the dates, but uh, then, uh, then I was sent home. Uh, and then I, I left there and I come back to Fort Bragg to be discharged. How was your feet at this time? They're okay. They, they still bother me now, but I mean it's uh, no more than usual. It's uh, it's just cold all the time and circulation bad. But I do all right. Be eighty year old. I'm thank goodness. I I I'm, I'm not like uh, most people. I guess I'm weird. But uh, but I see people growing disability and uh, I thought disability is when you lost an eye, you lost an arm or, or a leg or something. And uh, but I didn't know a. a if you have a scar on your arm and you get well, and I'm, I can do everything anybody else do. I, I'm not disabled for it. I'm concerned, you know. When the war ended in Europe, VE Day, did you celebrate? I, I think I was in. I, I think I was in uh, New York when it, it was old. Uh, I think when we landed in New York, it was old. I best I remember. I don't. I don't remember in detail what happened uh, on VE Day. I just know the war was over and everybody was happy in New York when we got off the boat and and all that stuff. But you didn't get out of service. Mm -hmm. 
I come home to Fort Bragg from there and got out of service, and then uh, a year or so later went back into the service again. So you were actually discharged. Yeah, I was discharged, and then uh, I re-enlisted uh, re again in uh, 45, 47 again. I had a break in service. Right. Uh, do you you remember the date of your discharge after World War Two? Uh, let's see. I think it was about October. I think it was about October. I don't remember exactly. But World War Two in the Pacific was over, also. No, they were planning. They were planning. Uh, they were planning on sending us there. See, and. Uh, but I, I went to uh, I went to Fort Bragg and uh, what do you want? And uh, and some somebody made me mad there right? because I'd been away from home two years. And he got up and uh, he strutting his stuff and told me you don't go nowhere, you don't leave his camp, you don't do it, you don't make no phone calls, you don't do nothing. I, I raised my hand. I said, listen, I, I only live nine miles from here. I haven't seen my folks in two years. He said, maybe you hard to hear, and I said, maybe you hard to hear, and, and I just walked out, and I called a taxi and went home. I got busted to a private, <laughs> and that's why I got out of service, and then I uh, joined the uh, Virginia National Guard and got back into service again. When you, were, uh, finally, when you were discharged before the Japanese surrendered, uh, and then you went home, what type of job did you get? I worked in, uh, that's where I met my wife in the Visco plant in uh, Pro Wall, Virginia. And how long did you work? Well, I worked in the uh, Norfolk Navy shipyard before that. And then I, I uh, that was in uh, 40, 46, I guess it was, 45, 46, I worked in Norfolk Navy shipyard. And uh, then I joined the National Guard in 47, as I remember. And uh, went back on active duty in 51, in 50 or 51. Could you tell me the name of the town that you fought nearby in Belgium, if you could remember? Uh, it's across the, across the uh, river Brest, Holland. Uh, and, uh, and up in, uh, what is the name of that little town up there, where all that? Arnhem, there's an Arnhem. Arnhem. Arnhem up there, yeah. and uh, Brest, Holland, and, uh, and uh, some little, not, not big towns up in there. Uh, I've forgotten. Son, the Son, maybe? Could be, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, now I'd like to switch to talk about what happened in Korea. Okay. How did you get involved in the military again? Well, I... I I didn't like. I didn't. Uh, I was militarized, and I, I, I worked at North Navy Shipyard, and uh, there was an old man there named Mister Bright, and he'd been working twenty years. He had several children. He and I worked the same thing. We were in a storekeeper, a storekeeper there, and uh, he come down. They were laying off everybody that could, and uh, veterans had ten points of preference, so. They come down and had, was going to fire this old man, you know, and uh, so uh, what do you want? And uh, you're going to fire Mr. Bright, and I told the lead man, I says, why, uh, why are you firing uh, why Mr. Bright? He said, well, I got to lose somebody. I says, if I go, well, I tell you, he said, if anybody go, I said, well, I'm out of here, and uh, and I left and went down and uh, joined the army. Went, I called Richmond and they put me on active duty and I went back in the army in 51, 50 I believe, in 50, and uh, it was in 50 then I went to uh, training over in Fort Eustis, Virginia, then they sent me to Korea from there. Now where did you land in Korea? In John. Did you see harsh fighting? I didn't see, I didn't see the harsh, I was, uh, I was there when uh, we were more or less in the, the whole position. I was with seventh division, and we had um, outposts way out. You know, we, we were behind a, a sort of a mountain. Then we'd have to go down a place like this. We had another outpost down below, see. 
and we had to uh, support it. And uh, that's one place that uh, we didn't. Uh, I went in there, and I was a the, the senior sergeant. I was the first sergeant at the time, and uh, uh, and uh, we didn't. Uh, company commander was a lieutenant, and uh, we didn't have nothing no higher than a corporal left, and and uh, so it was a. I don't know what happened there before or after, but uh, but we. We uh, stayed in there and went over to uh, this outpost. And you had to send people out there to take their take. They had to take their crude oil and all that stuff out for for eating, and sea rations and, and ammunition. And all and you have to go out at night and support. And then they come back over the hill. Of course, they would shell us all the time during that time. You know, trying to trying to do those things. That's the. Uh, that's the time I was lucky again. I've been lucky all along, because it come time for us for another trip out there to the we call it no man's land, because during the night everybody patrolled in between us and them, and so I said, well, I'll take the truck this time. So the driver, I told the driver, I said, let's I'll, let's go. He said, are you going? I said, yeah. So we went down to this uh, we went down to this uh, outpost, and. Uh, we stayed a little longer than we were supposed to or something and coming back, it's it's amazing coming back and, and I looked back and they were dropping mortar shells behind us as we were coming coming back and we had to go up a mountain. I told the driver, he says he says, We can't go so fast here. I says, You open this thing up because they already know we're here. And he hit I I can still hear the little change of bang a bang a bang and you see that thing dropping behind us? And we come over that hill like that, and where they couldn't get us no more. And I went back to my tent, and I had orders to come home. So I've been lucky all the time. I, I just hit streaks of luck like that, I guess. Did you carry any good luck charm during either war? No, uh, I was married and had children then, you know. So I just want to get home. That's all. Did you join any Veterans Administration? Yeah, I belonged to. Uh, uh, DAV, and uh, I'm a lifetime member there, and uh, NCOA, I'm a lifetime member there, and I donate, we donate to uh, uh, w World War something, where they send us stamps and we donate to them all the time. Uh, Have you visited the World War II Memorial yet? No, not yet. It's, it's kind of sad for me to go, I don't know if I want to go or not. I really don't know if I want to go or not. Because uh, there'd be people up there that I didn't know got killed and, or anything. It'd be sad for me to go. Uh, I don't know if I want to go or not. Do you keep in touch with any of the men of the 101st today? Uh, no. No. I don't, I don't know of any of them that's live today. We have about five minutes or three, four minutes left. Is there any final thoughts, anything you want to uh, say? to sum up your uh, wartime experience? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I'm probably a little more patriotic than most people are. As, I, as you notice, you look around, that, uh, that uh, I'm very patriotic in uh, what I believe in, and that's this country. And uh, and I uh, I would go again if I had to. And, uh, I'm not, I, I can't cope with a present service like it is because I'm an old soldier. And uh, I can't. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to even survive today, Darby, out there, because uh, the discipline and everything has changed so much, and the priorities have changed, and the electronics and everything has changed so much that uh, I'd be lost. But uh, my heart's out there anyway. Well, thank you, Mr. McLean.